for that introduction. Um, well, I can't believe the crowd you get, I guess when you invite Rick Osfeld to come talk, um, this is what you get, I never get this. Um, I know we all very much want to hear what he has to say about these really important issues and what he thinks about all this, including me. So I'm just going to give a very short introduction um, to the topic and hopefully just ease the transition for some of you who maybe have just come from the clinic, maybe working with sick patients, you're in medical school or veterinary school in the typical curriculum where we're just dealing with um, very much focused on treating the individual patient. Maybe um, you've been actually working at the herd level, but still this is a major change in scale um, because here we're looking at global patterns in infectious disease. And why are we looking at the patterns of infectious disease at this enormous scale? And I had to put in this little trailer for the maybe I haven't seen yet, um, but I think we're doing this because nowadays diseases are really emerging as that tra trailer says, the world goes viral September 9th, I guess. I but these things are very much emerging on the global stage all at once. Um, that's a very campy quote, but I think um, it's probably quite true. Did anyone see this movie? How long did it take that virus to traverse all these cities? Couple weeks, couple weeks. So yeah, pretty much all at once when you're talking about a disease response, um, not much time there. So many people agree with actually the premise of this movie, which is that the 21st century holds a very scary prospect for newly emerging diseases with pandemic potential. And this is true now more than ever, now that we've got this rapid movement of new pathogens into susceptible populations with global travel and transport of people, animals, and animals products through the wildlife trade and the domestic animal trade. And coincidentally, of course, our collective power to alter the landscape and create large-scale environmental change has increased dramatically over the past century as well. So this has, of course, contributed to substantial gains in human well-being and economic development for many of us, but at growing costs for some, and definitely at costs to degradation of ecosystem services that we rely heavily on and abrupt changes in ecosystem function and regulation, for example, emerging infectious disease. So some of the examples of these major forces of global change that may be related to emerging infectious disease include human population growth, which has increased about 90 million per year at the end of the last century. And along with that, all the accompanying landscape change, massive urbanization, industrialization, the agricultural practices that go along with having to feed all of these people, widespread use of antibiotics in the agricultural practices mainly, climate change, increased contact and consumption of wildlife, um, and of course migration and movements at the international scale. The theory is then that if disease emergence or outbreaks of infectious disease are an unfortunate consequence of these sorts of ecosystem change. So the data to back up this theory primarily comes from phylogenetic, really good phylogenetic evidence actually, that most major human illnesses originated from animals and that pathogen emergence is linked to these large scale changes in anthropogenic activities. So again, we're talking on a really large scale, but this time a temporal scale, not quite geologic, but over centuries, think over centuries. So this is a paper by um, Nathan Wolf et al. that was published in 2007 in Nature that links the domestication of animals, mainly livestock and chickens, to the emergence of major human illnesses, including diphtheria, measles, mumps, pertussis, smallpox, and TB. And this paper also really nicely shows these five stages through which pathogens that are exclusively infecting animals, if you can see at the bottom, stage one, move up evolutionarily or evolve into pathogens that exclusively infect humans. So you can see those are classic pathogens that have moved through these different stages. Rabies is sort of stuck at stage two evolutionarily. You need to have a direct bite from an animal to be infected with rabies. But then these other pathogens that have moved up to stage three can cause a few cycles of transmission between humans. And Ebola is a classic example of that before that epidemic dies out pretty quickly, fortunately, for that highly pathogenic virus. And then you've got stage four where you can have more of sustained outbreak transmission between humans, maybe even in an urban cycle where people are giving it to each other, but the reservoir is primarily wildlife. And then you've got pathogens that have moved all the way up through stage five, like HIV, which are just now only transmitted between humans. 
So this paper and many others suggest that the ultimate origin of many of these common human illnesses are actually wild animals. Most of these zoonoses that are on this here, this slide, have gone through four or five of the evolutionary stages shown on the last slide. And the zoonotic pathogens from wildlife that are expected to be a significant source of emerging infectious diseases, especially in these tropical climates where biodiversity is very high. So it makes perfectly, perfectly good sense that in a highly biodiverse area, where you've got a lot of wildlife species richness, so a ton of different wildlife species that live together in close proximity, that you would basically have, consequently, a very rich pool of pathogens because a lot of species have their own set of pathogens that could be a source of emerging infectious disease. So those pathogens are just there, awaiting for enough contact opportunities with people to jump across the species boundary to go from wildlife to humans and cause an emerging infectious disease in people. Many leading scientists think that the zoonotic pathogens emerging from these wildlife taxa, primarily primates, non-human primates, and rodents, um, and maybe birds, are one of the greatest threats to human well-being in the 21st century. So this is mainly because nowadays we've got massive human population growth, especially in these very highly biodiverse areas with a lot of species richness, which greatly increases the opportunities for disease transmission. So we think of infectious disease, we're not used to this, thinking along these lines typically as clinicians, but infectious disease is typically a density-dependent problem in populations because you need contact between an infected individual and a susceptible individual for effective disease transmission. So this is a picture from the Bluegrass Festival that I was at on Saturday in San Francisco. And just look at all the opportunities there for disease transmission. Sure enough, my six-year-old home sick yesterday. So this is basically because effective disease transmission is a basic mathematical function, function of contact rate. So the so-called crowd diseases, such as influenza, do really well for a very long time in large populations that are very dense. But never mind the math, you can see the amazing opportunities for disease transmission in those porta potties over there, especially with nowhere to wash your hands, which um, is a bit disturbing for me. Anyway, um, on top of that, if you've got the biodiversity and the high level of human population growth and density, and then you add these very specific anthropogenic activities that, such as subsistence hunting or consumption of bush meat, a lot of these pictures are from our collaborators at the Wildlife Conservation Society who've been working in these areas, um, also from the wildlife trade. This is the wildlife trade in Peru. And you've got a lot of different species coming in close contact with each other and humans. You've got a lot of direct contact and you just increase opportunities for pathogens to cross these species boundaries. So the most recent work that's linked the biodiversity to infectious disease puts all of these things together at a very large scale, grouping viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi, which from a clinical perspective, I think um, is, is not intuitive to a lot of us, but it's what you need to look at that really large scale to see which of these forces of large scale environmental change are related to disease emergence events. And so um, what they found was that once you adjust for reporting bias, the biodiversity and human population density was most highly correlated with emerging disease events, again, on a global scale. And this was all published in this paper by Kate Jones in Nature in 2008. And this is basically the risk model that they produced, which is um, based on grids at the 100 kilometer level that shows the likelihood of disease emerges events in these um, hotspot areas, so-called hotspot areas, and their model's completely based on biodiversity and human population density. So I think I just, at that point, want to really turn it over quickly to Dr. Osfeld to hear what he thinks about this. Take it from there. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Chris, and also Kate, um, who couldn't be here today for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here and to talk to such a diverse group of, of people about this, this topic today. Um, um, so what I want to do is pick up where Chris left off. Um, and I want to talk about a research program that is at the intersection between two of what I see as the preeminent environmental crises that face us in the 21st century. One of these is the crisis of biodiversity loss, and the other is the crisis of emerging infectious diseases that we, we saw such an excellent introduction just now by Chris. 
So let me just start by introducing the crisis of biodiversity loss, which is something that is probably no surprise to anyone in this room. You're probably all aware that we are now experiencing a biodiversity crisis that is unprecedented in its scope, in its rapidity, and it, in its impact on planet Earth. And here are a few grim statistics about this biodiversity crisis. So for, for example, about 2,000 species of Pacific Island birds have gone extinct since human occupation of those islands. 120 amphibian species have gone extinct just in the past few decades, and fully a third of extant species are threatened with extinction. At current rates of extinction in the mammals, up to 50% of all species will go extinct in the next 200 years. And on average, across all taxa on the planet, there's one extinction that occurs about every 20 minutes. So about three extinctions will occur somewhere on the planet as you listen to us talk uh, this, this afternoon. So all of these bullets here, these four bullets, all refer to once and for all irrevocable, irretrievable species extinctions. But another aspect of the biodiversity crisis is that populations go extinct. But they're almost never documented. Um, and and they're, they're probably vastly more rampant than species extinction. But neither the actual population extinction nor its consequences are monitored. And we know very little about the consequences. So the other major environmental crisis um, is what Chris just talked uh, some, some about, which is that of emerging infectious diseases. And this is a slide from that same Jones et al. Nature paper from 2008. Um, where they documented that fully, well, and I find this an astonishing number, 335 disease, infectious diseases of humans have emerged since 1940. And this slide shows you where on the planet those diseases have actually emerged. Now I call this an environmental crisis because, as Chris said, the vast majority of these diseases come from nature somewhere. So of those 335 diseases, about 60% are zoonotic, which means that the pathogen replicates within and is transmitted from some non-human vertebrate to humans. Of those zoonotic diseases, about 72% are from wildlife, with the remainder coming from domesticated animals of various kinds. Contrary to conventional wisdom, they actually have a temperate zone concentration. This is from this same paper that argued that there were biodiversity hotspots in the tropics. And I wasn't going to talk about this, but I can't help it now with that, that introduction, the provocative introduction, and the way these data are interpreted. The only way you go from this temperate zone hotspots in the actual data to biodiversity hotspots in the tropics is if you use their method of accounting for a reporting bias. And I hadn't looked up the exact details, but my recollection is, and you can look this up on their paper, that the way they accounted for the reporting bias in these EIDs was to, uh, was to look at the journal, infectious disease, journal of Infectious Diseases and to uh, look at the country of origin of the authors on papers in the Journal of Infectious Diseases and to discount the reporting of these emerging infectious diseases as a function of the commonness of that country of origin of authors in the paper. So although it's undoubtedly the case that accounting for reporting bias is important, whether that's a valid method and whether we should go from the actual data, which show a temperate distribution of EIDs, to their interpretation, which is that the tropics represent the greatest risk, is, I think, a big, important, and unanswered question. OK, and the other point here is that the, the, the rate of emergence has been increasing through time, as shown in these bar graphs right here, at least through the 20th century. So what I'm going to do is discuss <clears throat> my answer, at least as it exists so far, to this question, which is, does high vertebrate biodiversity reduce human risk of exposure of emerging zoonotic diseases? Or you could ask this from the converse, which is to say that, does the loss of vertebrate biodiversity increase our risk of exposure to emerging infectious diseases or zoonotic diseases. And what I'm going to do is spend most of my time talking about a case study that I've worked in for a number of years, which is the Lyme disease system. But at the end, I'm going to try to generalize from the Lyme disease system to many other uh, infectious diseases, both zoonotic and otherwise. So let's jump into Lyme disease. Um, this is a poster I found on the internet of a bunch of Lyme disease patients who are proudly showing you their 
uh, erythema migrans or bullseye rash. This is the classic early, uh, early stage symptom of Lyme disease. Other early symptoms include fever, chills, muscle aches, lethargy, and the like. Um, late stage Lyme disease systems can be considerably more debilitating. They include facial palsy, um, other neurological disorders, including central nervous system disorders, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, carditis, um, and, and other manifestations. So Lyme disease is one of these emerging infectious diseases. It was first discovered in the mid-1970s in Lyme, Connecticut. And then in 1982, it became a notifiable disease through the CDC. And as the data in this slide demonstrate, the number of reported cases of Lyme disease has grown uh, rather dramatically from a few hundred cases in the early 1980s to a few tens of thousands of cases in the last several years. Uh, these are reported cases, and this is thought to be a vast underrepresentation, probably on the order of about a tenth of the actual number of cases of Lyme disease. But irrespective of how accurate these reporting data are, Lyme disease is by far the most frequently uh, reported vector-borne disease in the temperate zone of the world, including the United States. Lyme disease has several major foci in the U.S. Uh, one is, the, the biggest one is the northeastern uh, seaboard from about Virginia to Maine. Another one is the upper Midwest. And then in some years, there are quite a number of cases reported in central and northern coastal California as well. Lyme disease is caused by this spirochete bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi, and, and that bacterium gets transmitted among wildlife hosts and from wildlife to humans by the bite of an exoded tick. In most of the United States, the culprit is the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis. Here in California, the culprit is the western black-legged tick, Ixodes pacificus, a very closely related species. So what I'm showing you here in this panel are the three post-egg life stages in the life cycle of the tick. That's a larva, a nymph, and an adult. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the natural history of this tick life cycle in order to set the stage for understanding how biodiversity is important in influencing our risk of exposure to Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. So each of these three life stages takes a single blood meal from a vertebrate host, with that blood meal lasting anywhere from about three days to a week. So, and when each stage after it takes its single blood meal, drops off the host and molts into the next stage. So the larva takes its single blood meal, drops off, molts into a nymph. The nymph takes its blood meal, drops off, molts into an adult. The adult takes its blood meal, uh, drops off, and it reproduces and dies. So, but critical natural history information is, first of all, that these larval ticks hatch out of eggs free of infection with Lyme disease bacteria because of essentially non-existent transovarial transmission of the pathogen from mother ticks uh, to her, through her eggs and to her offspring. So we humans probably get bitten in many animals by larval black-legged ticks without any health consequences because they're uninfected and we never know because they're so tiny. These larval ticks, though, are highly generalized in their choice of hosts and they will feed on virtually anything that has fur or feathers, or even in California that has scales, um, happily feeding on a, a huge variety of terrestrial vertebrate hosts. If they happen to feed on an infected host, they may acquire a Lyme disease infection or a Borrelia infection, in, in which case they'll molt into a nymph capable of transmitting that infection to their host that they bite as a nymph. So larvae are uninfected, highly generalized. In fact, all these life stages are highly generalized in their choice of host. But the other critical natural history feature is that the vast majority of Lyme disease cases are transmitted by these guys here, the nymphs. And that's because they are very tiny. They reach their activity peak in midsummer, early summer, late spring sometimes, when humans reach their outdoor activity peak. And because they're so, so tiny, that we often have no idea that we were ever bitten by a tick, and the first thing we know about Lyme disease is feeling the symptom. So another way of looking at this life cycle is, is to look, this whole life cycle plays out over two years. So again, reiterating, the larvae hatch out of eggs and become active in the, in the midsummer, feeding from a host of different, sorry, a, a wide range of different hosts in this system. They then take their single blood meal, they drop off, and they spend almost an entire year in a quiescent state 
in the soil or under the leaf litter before becoming active as a nymph. They take their single blood meal again the following late spring or early summer, which is when transmission to the next round of hosts takes place. So when we're interested in human risk of exposure to Lyme disease, what we really need to know is how big is that nymphal peak? How many nymphs? What's the population density of nymphs out there crawling around on the forest floor that we may encounter when we go off into the woods, and how many of them are infected? So that's what we're going to ask, is how biodiversity influences how many ticks there are and how many are infected, because those are the risk factors to you and me of getting Lyme disease. So what we've done at the Cary Institute, where I work, um, is we've monitored the abundance of all three of these life stages for about the past 15 or 20 years. And what we found is this, what I find to be interesting and somewhat surprising result, which is that there is no relationship at all between the abundance of larval ticks last year, so this is larval tick density in year T minus one, and the abundance of nymphal ticks in this year, this year. So in other words, there's no what we call demographic forcing in this system. We might expect that the more larvae there were last year, the more nymphs there would be this year. So we would expect a positive correlation. We see nothing even approaching that. So what that means is that the size of the larval cohort is relatively unimportant in determining our risk, but it's what happens to those larval ticks. So what we need to know, so again, how many larvae there were, were last year is unimportant, but what happens to those larvae, how many of them get converted by the vertebrate community into infected ticks is what really matters to our health. So if we want to know how does biodiversity influence our risk of exposure to Lyme disease, what we need to do is determine for each of the important host species in this community, what role do they play in converting these, these larval ticks, which do not transmit disease, into infected nymphs, which actually do? So, and that's what we've spent considerable time doing and that what I'm about to describe to you right now. So we can divide that process of converting help, uh, harmless larval ticks into harmful nymphal ticks into a series, exhaustive series of steps. And those are shown right here. So we might expect each host species to have a different rate of encounter with these host-seeking or questing larval ticks on the forest floor. And that might be a result of its body size or the way that host animal uses space. They should encounter ticks at species-specific rates, or so we would expect. But not all those ticks that encounter a host are going to be able to feed successfully, because many get groomed off and killed in the process. So we might expect each host species to have a permissiveness level, meaning what's the probability that a larval tick trying to feed actually does successfully feed, with the rest being killed by the host during grooming. The combination of tick encounters and host permissiveness should determine what the, in the parlance is called the body burden. And this is simply the actual average number of larval ticks that you count on a member of each of these species in nature. So what's the actual number of ticks, larval ticks, that you find during the larval peak on each host species. Once the larval tick feeds, it then has to drop off the host, molt into the nymphal stage, and survive the winter. We might expect each species to provide a different quality or quantity of a blood meal that might influence these two processes as well. And then lastly, we would expect each host species to have a different propensity to infect that feeding larval tick, which we call the reservoir competence, resulting in an infected tick, which is uh, symbolized by these red ones here. So what I'm now going to do is walk you through, we have asked this question of a series of representative host species for each of these processes to try to understand the role of biodiversity in the transmission dynamics of this disease. And what I'm going to do is start with uh, host permissiveness. So for this study, what we did was we went out in the midsummer, the larval peak in activity, and we captured six representative species that span a variety of taxonomic affiliations, body sizes, life history, variation, et cetera. So we went out and we captured gray squirrels, eastern chipmunks, gray catbirds, white-footed mice, Virginia opossums, and vireos. We held them in the lab for about three or four days until their natural tick burdens had all dropped off. So they were now tick-free at this point. We then inoculated each individual with 100 um, larval ticks, which may sound like a lot, but that's nothing compared to what these things experience in the real world. 
This is well below what they might experience on their own out in the environment. And then we, we followed the fate of all of those ticks in, in the laboratory over the next several days to a week. And there are basically two fates. Either those ticks, larval ticks, feed to repletion, or they get killed in the process of trying as a function of host blooming. So this is what we found. Um, we found that there was dramatic variation among these host species in what we call their permissiveness. So what we found is that about 50% of the larval ticks attempting to feed on white-footed mice successfully did so, um, fed to repletion and dropped off so that they would then survive to the nymphal stage. So that's at one extreme. At the other extreme, only 3.5% of the larval ticks that attempted to feed on opossums were successful with the rest being killed in the process of trying. Well, when we go out and capture these individuals of these various species in the wild in August of, of any given year, you can calculate the, the actual body burden. What's the average number of larval ticks you find on one of these hosts in the wild? And so this shows, again, huge variation across different host species in their body burdens. So for instance, uh, the average mouse feeds about 25 larval ticks. Jumping over to squirrels, the average gray squirrel feeds about 150. And the average opossum feeds about 250 larval ticks per individual uh, during the peak of, of larval activity. So now, if we know the actual body burden of larval ticks on each mem member of this host community, and we know from the host permissiveness study what fraction that re represents out of all the ticks that attempt to feed on those hosts, we can then back calculate the tick encounter rate with that host species, with those that don't make it onto the body burden, but being assumed to be killed in the process of trying. So here we are estimating how many ticks get killed by each of these host species in the process of attempting a blood meal. And what we find, again, this is the theme here, they vary a lot. So for mice, an average mouse kills about 50 larval ticks per host per week. The average gray squirrel kills 843. And the average opossum kills a whopping 5,686 larval ticks that attempt to feed on it per host per week by our calculations. So I'm sorry for this gross out slide right after lunch, but um, those ticks that do successfully feed on a wild host need to then uh, drop off the host, molt into the nymphal stage, and overwinter in order to survive to a nymph that can infect us. So we have asked whether the, the identity of the host species influences molting success and overwinter survival. And we put these fed ticks from a known host species out into these soil cores, out in nature, and retrieve them uh, the following late spring or early summer to see how many have molted, how many have survived the winter. And again, we find significant variation among hosts. For opossums and squirrels, about 25% uh, or so of these ticks molt and survive the winter, whereas for these other hosts, between 50 and 70% or so of the ticks actually successfully molt and survive the winter. And then lastly, we have quite dramatic variation among the hosts in their reservoir competence. This is the probability that they will infect one of those feeding larvae with Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme spirochete. 90% of ticks, of larval ticks, dropping off a wild caught white footed mouse acquire an infection, molt into a tick that's capable of transmitting the disease to you and me. A couple of other small mammals have intermediate levels of reservoir competence, and these other mammalian and um, avian hosts generally have quite low reservoir competence values. So, what this allows us to do is put together a table for, for most of these parameters for six species, but for some of them for many more than that. And we can ask how, how many ticks does an individual of each of these species feed, kill, and infect in a given year? So with these data in hand, we can then go out in the field, and we have done this, it takes an enormous amount of effort, is estimate the average population density at which these host species exist. With, with data on these various parameters and on host population density, we can then ask how many ticks does a population of each of these host species 
feed, kill, and infect. With those data, we can then use a simple model, a simple accounting model, to create a community of hosts that mimics a diverse community that we might see in nature. And with each of the species in this community existing at the population density that we find that it does in nature. And we can ask, what is the density of infected nymphs we expect to be produced by that community of hosts, given the data that we've collected in the field and lab? Once we're armed with a predicted density of infected nymphs that you expect from that entire community, we can then use the model to disassemble the community. We're going to reduce biodiversity and ask, what impact does a reduction in biodiversity have on the main risk factor that we're going to be exposed to Lyme disease, this density of infected nymphs? So we're going to start doing this by using the model and plucking out species one at a time to ask how the removal of that particular species influences the density of infected nymphs. So that's what we've done in this slide. And here what we find is that removing species such as the opossum and the squirrel, so we're removing these species individually and holding all other species constant, that increases the density of infected nymphs by about 30%. So clearly, those two species are serving a strongly protective role. If you get rid of them, risk goes up. At the other end of the spectrum is the white-footed mouse. If you remove mice from this model system, you get a reduction in the density of infected nymphs by about 75%. So clearly, white-footed mice are serving a strong amplifying role. Now, this is a nice heuristic, but unfortunately, this is not the way that communities in the real world are disassembled. There's no great deity in the sky that comes and plucks species one at a time out of these communities. That actually, by, by studying vertebrate diversity in dozens and dozens of different uh, forested landscapes throughout the Northeast, we have determined, or we have estimated, um, the approximate order. There's a, there's a more or less predictable sequence by which species disappear from these vertebrate communities. And they disappear. V vertebrate diversity is lost in the northeastern US, and for that matter, most of the world, as a consequence of habitat destruction and fragmentation. So we study vertebrate communities in, in forest fragments of different sizes and contexts with different levels of fragmentation, and look to see which are the species that drop out soon, early, um, which are the species that persist even under heavy fragmentation and heavy forest destruction. And it turns out that going from left to right is basically the sequence, the predictable sequence of species loss under forest fragmentation. So viries are a forest interior bird. They disappear very quickly when forests are fragmented. Virginia opossums are fairly large bodied and require a, a, a larger area in which to maintain viable populations. And going down to uh, the, the white-footed mouse, which is the only species that we found in all terrestrial communities, no matter how nasty, degraded, fragmented, um, this was the last mouse standing in, in all cases. So this is the species that is by far the most ubiquitous and never disappears, no matter what you do to the terrestrial environment, even in parking lots. They're in my kitchen right now. So now what we want to do is use the model to disassemble this community in the sequence that species are actually lost in nature as best as we can determine it. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to look at the density of infected nymphs, first in the intact community, in which there are, uh, it looks like about 1,300 or so in infected nymphs that come from an intact community, according to our model. And then we're going to remove host species from the model in this natural order that I just described. So we remove viries, there's essentially no effect on risk. We remove viries and opossums, we get a jump in the density of infected nymphs. We're removing three species, we get really quite a dramatic jump. We're removing four, it's going way up. And then finally, we remove five species, so mice are the only game in town, which mimics the real world. And we see this increase, it's about a four-fold increase in the density of infected nymphs as you disassemble this community from high to low diversity. So this is what the model tells us should happen. And um, as an empirical scientist, I want to know whether that model, even though it's parameterized with field and lab data, it's, a, it's heavily parameterized model, 
we wanted to know whether this is the kind of relationship we see in the real world. And so what we did was we went out into the county where I live and work in southeastern New York, and we assessed tick abundance and infection prevalence in 14 fragments of different sizes that were all embedded in a suburban matrix in and around Poughkeepsie, New York, beautiful Poughkeepsie, New York. Our expectation was that there would be more infected ticks in small fragments due to reduced host diversity as you chop up forest into little bits. And what we found was support for the model prediction. In fact, we had a strong and significant negative relationship between the size of the forest fragment and the density of infected nymphs in that fragment. And whether coincidentally or not, what we found is that on average, the density of infected nymphs was about fourfold higher on average in the small fragments as compared to somewhat larger fragments. So more interesting, so we call this, Felicia Kiesing and I call this the dilution effect, this protective effect of high diversity on disease transmission, we call the dilution effect. And, and we've been very interested in how general this phenomenon is. Is this only a characteristic of Lyme disease? Does it occur in other systems as well? And so I think your assigned reading, at least some of you for this course, was this paper that we published last year in Nature asking how widespread is the dilution effect beyond just this case study in which I've described now. And what this paper showed is that of 21 different disease systems in which a relationship between diversity and pathogen transmission was studied, 19 of them showed a, a protective effect of high diversity and a, 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 an amplifying effect of the loss of diversity or increased risk as diversity was lost. And, and, and the, those disease systems span the range of zoonotic diseases, those of marine animals, of invertebrates, of vertebrates, of plants, of livestock, of companion animals, and the like. That paper reviewed the literature between 2005 and 2010. And what I want to briefly show you is that um, two more recent studies, very briefly show you, is that two studies that came out in the past couple of weeks have also showed strong support for a dilution effect. This paper came out a few weeks ago, and, and UC Davis researchers were involved in this. And basically, this looked at um, plant diversity and sudden oak death in California systems. And this was a massive study, non-experimental, 280 plots, over 79,000 hectares. And they found that disease risk was lower in sites with higher plant species diversity. And this paper came out last week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This looks at chytridiomycosis, um, an emerging disease of amphibians that is causing declines and extinctions of amphibians worldwide. This was a carefully controlled, well-replicated experimental study in which they created um, laboratory systems with diversity going from low on the left to high on the right. And whether you look at infection prevalence or infection severity, the more species you have in these systems, the lower the disease transmission in the case of uh, BD, Betrachochytrium dendrobotitis. So why does this dilution effect seem to operate so widely? Um, this is what we're interested in now. So I'm going to give you a little, of a little bit of a speculation here at the end. So one key parameter, key aspect of these systems that seems to be extremely general is that hosts vary in their quality for parasites. But that variation is not random. It looks like it is generally the case that the best hosts for, the path for pathogen transmission tend to remain when biodiversity is lost. Well, and, and so in the Lyme disease system, very quickly, what we saw is that the white-footed mouse is the most competent host for the pathogen. It's the most competent host for the vector. It's the host with the highest population density. And it's ubiquitous. And we found that other hosts represented by this opossum are less competent for the pathogen and the vector. They have lower population density. And they tend to be present only when diversity is higher. So what we want to know is why. Why is there a correlation between host competence and ecological ubiquity? And it, to our minds, there are two possibilities. One is that there's adaptation by pathogens. And the other is that there's adaptation by hosts. But I caution that we do not see these in, as, as mutually exclusive in any way. So 
we speculated, Felicia Keesing and I speculated about this 11 years ago. We, we said this, and I think I'm going to cut to the, well, we expect pathogens that are transmitted by generalist vectors to have had opportunities to interact and possibly co-evolve with multiple host species across many ecological communities. Under such conditions, we expect that selection might favor pathogen genotypes that are able to exploit the dominant members of an ecological community, which would provide them with the most stable habitats, promoting persistence. It's a very long-winded way of saying we expect general pathogens to adapt to the most common host in the system. If that's the case, then, we should see a positive correlation between the population density of the host and host quality for that pathogen, such that hosts that occur at very high density are the ones that pathogens have adapted to, and those should be the hosts in which they fare the best, in which their fitness is highest. And in fact, in the Lyme disease system, we see exactly this relationship. When we look at reservoir competence for those hosts that I showed you earlier, we find a very strong positive correlation between the average population density of that host and the competence of that host for Borrelia burgdorferi. We even see a somewhat weaker, but again, a positive correlation between host permissiveness, so competence of that host as a, as a host for the tick, and population density uh, of, of, the, of that host species. But I, so this supports the notion that pathogens are, are evolving. Pathogen evolution might be responsible for the pattern. But this does not mean that host evolution might not play a part. And in fact, I strongly suspect that it does. And the reason I do is because there are many other life history features of these vertebrates that co-vary with population density. And it may be that population density per se is unimportant, but is actually spuriously correlated um, with the, with the host quality in the system. So for instance, hosts that occur at high density tend to be small in body size. They tend to have very fast life histories. They live fast. They die young. They breed explosively. They're good dispersers. And we speculate that because of this fast life history, that they may have a weaker adaptive immunity or a weaker immune response is irrespective of whether it's adaptive or innate. And what we're thinking here is that if you have a life history where you live fast, die young, your fitness is determined by how explosively you can reproduce, how well you can avoid predators. It may be that infectious disease is the least of your worries. And that in fact, you don't allocate scarce resources to defending yourself, especially adaptive immunity in which for these species, you may not have repeated exposures to a lot of these pathogens because you die too quickly. And so what I'll, I'll leave you with is the notion that what all these host species have in common, these ones that serve strongly amplifying roles, is they tend to have a fast life history. And that leads, on the one hand, to very high ecological resilience in, in the face of disturbance and biodiversity loss. At the same time, we're speculating here, and I don't have time to show you evidence, that they have lower investment in adaptive immunity for the reasons that I just described. If that's the case, then that could lead to high host quality. They're simply not clearing infections. They're a good environment for pathogens to reproduce. And to whatever extent this is true, if you do have a confluence of high resilience and high host quality by this mechanism or any others, you will automatically get the dilution effect, the situation in which low diversity communities contain highest quality hosts, and these are less prevalent in high diversity communities. So my parting shot is that this decade that has just started in 2011 has been deemed by the UN the, uh, the, the decade on biodiversity. And I would argue, based on these results and others, that it's critical, critical now to see biodiversity loss and what we do about it not just as an aesthetic or an ethical issue, but because biodiversity loss has, I think, profound consequences to human health, animal health, plant health, microbial health, that we see it as a health-related issue and not just an ethical or aesthetic one. So I'll just put these acknowledgments up without going through them. And um, if there's time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you.